If you're not interested in nerding out, you probably want to bounce right now because I'm going to totally nerd out. I was trying to figure something out. All right, you might know my story. I was super overweight. I was 300 pounds, sedentary, pre-diabetic, the whole works, right? And then I turned my life around, started doing keto, started doing intermittent fasting, a bunch of other changes, of course, like obviously a bunch of variables thrown into the pot. But I transformed my body really quick. Like I lost, you know, over 100 pounds in like a year, a little under a year and a half. So it all happened pretty quick. Now, I'm a realistic person. So it got me thinking, like, why did I respond to keto so well? And why do some people I know respond so, so well and so fast to keto and fasting, but then other people that I know, maybe they still respond to it, but it goes a little slower. And I started thinking about my childhood and I started thinking about my activities and what I used to do. And I started thinking about people that I know and love that have lost a lot of weight with keto. And I started thinking about their childhood. So I queried a few people and I tried to figure this out. So this video is purely my hypothesis, okay? It's purely a hypothesis. However, there's a lot of little truths in here and I just wanted to kind of put it out there and get you to think about it because that's what I'm about abstract and thinking forward right before I get into that I want to ask please do check out Thrive Market down below in the description if you're new to my channel then you probably haven't seen them before but Thrive Market is an awesome online membership based grocery store they've been a supporter and a sponsor of this channel for three years more than three years and they are awesome they are where you get your keto goodies your fasting goodies and they deliver them right to your doorstep so you end up saving the time and the money and the effort of having to go to the grocery store and a plop comes right to your doorstep plus I have some of my specific shopping lists there so you can see things that I would recommend so there's a link down below for you to check out. Now let's talk epigenetics. Okay, you might remember from biology class, there was a guy called uh, Lamarck, right? There was Lamarck versus Darwin. And just to kind of paraphrase, like put this into quick context, basically Darwin kind of theorized that survival of the fittest. He would say like if a giraffe, for instance, uh, had a longer neck, then it would survive and it would give birth to giraffes with longer necks. And it was a survival of the fittest based on that kind of genetic adaptation that was just there. Whereas Lamarck was kind of like, well, a giraffe's gonna stretch its neck. And as a result, that activity of stretching its neck is gonna pass through in the genes to its offspring and that neck's gonna get longer generationally, right? That's sort of what epigenetics is now in kind of a way, but the point is is that both of those things are true. There's like this predisposed kind of genetic thing that is like what you are born with, what you have in your kind of uh, hereditary line. And then there's things like as we adapt and as we change and as we, I guess, for lack of a better term, evolve. But it's just anyhow, that's neither here nor there. Point is, my childhood was interesting. I ran my first marathon at a very young age. And if you're a veteran of this channel, then you know that endurance work or low intensity cardio similarly acts like keto does in the body. Your body gets very accustomed to utilizing fats because you're running at a relatively low intensity for long periods of time, which utilizes what's called beta oxidation. It allows the body to use fats as a fuel source. So in essence, when that happens, my theory was, well, maybe because I did so much running as a young child, even though I ended up overweight later on, maybe that allowed me to develop sort of mitochondrial machinery and I maybe I got fat adapted at such a young age that coming back to it 30 20 years later maybe that's why I was able to just get an effect from ketosis but then it kind of begs the question well if you look at that mitochondrial biogenesis and the half-life of mitochondrial biogenesis it usually take it's it's over in like six weeks right so that would say that the fat adaptation that I had as a small child carried with me for 20 years I don't know if that is particularly the case, but if we get really nerdy, we start looking at like DNA hypomethylation and hypermethylation, then some things start to make sense. This is like an oversimplification of epigenetics, but basically uh, what the whole methylation process with our DNA is, is when we are exercising or doing some kind of extreme activity, we have what is called a hypomethylation of our DNA. And basically in a nutshell, what this means is at that point in time, our DNA becomes a little bit more malleable. Uh, the likelihood of us being able to actually transcribe and actually uh, change our genetic structure is very high. 
So one could argue that when I was a young child and I was doing so much pretty extreme running, I mean, I really was, and I also backpacked like the John Muir Trail at 12 years old, which is a 212 mile backpacking trip. Like I did a lot of pretty extreme endurance work. And on one hand, it's kind of what led me to be overweight because I really did start to damage my knees at a young age. But at the other side of the equation is I think from a genetic or epigenetic standpoint, I might have had that hypomethylation of my DNA that allowed me to sort of encode to be able to utilize fats a little bit better. But let's come back to that for just a second, in just a second. Um, I look at other people that I know, and it was kind of interesting. I would say on average about seven out of 10 people that I know that were overweight and lost weight just so happened to also be athletes in high school. Purely speculative, please don't hold me to this because I mean, my data is just my data, right? But the point is, is that hmm, a lot of people that gained weight and then lost it were athletes. Does that mean that maybe they just have an athletic mindset where they know how to dis have discipline uh, and then they just kind of sh shuffle that discipline to different areas of their life? For example, I was disciplined in athletics but then when I went into my career, I got disciplined in my career and wasn't really disciplined in athletics anymore. Then I figured out how to be disciplined in both and got older and wiser and wrinkly and bags under my eyes and you know the decrepit guy you see in front of you today. But there's a lot of other people that kind of have a similar story. They were like all-star athletes and then they got into their careers and lost it. Then it's just, again, forward thinking here. Is it epigenetic or is it psychological? Or is it a combination of both? Because it's looking like a lot of these people were athletes when they were younger. Then we take it one step further and we're like, wait a minute, there's a lot of people that are active when they're younger. So maybe they have a degree of fat adaptation that kind of occurred in an epigenetic level. Now my situation was probably even more extreme given the fact that I ran a marathon at 11 years old and then ran a bunch more. Like I just did a lot of running. So could that have been that maybe at that point in time I developed a lot of mitochondrial biogenesis too through what's called PGC1A, right? PGC1A is going to be activated by sirtuins, which ultimately allows for the encoding of specific longevity genes, but also more so mitochondrial biogenesis, creating more mitochondria. If I have more mitochondria, that means I can produce more energy and I can produce more energy from fats, okay? Now, that is something that could have carried with me overall. Did I change my muscle fiber types? Did I change, uh, did I have more uh, cerebral blood flow? Did I have more cerebral ketones? Ketones getting into my bloodstream, crossing the blood brain barrier. Did I have more of that occurring given the chronic AMPK state that I was living in at a young age? Did it give me different brain development that makes me think a certain way much better in ketosis than otherwise? Am everything that I'm saying, is it just completely biased because I feel so great in ketosis? I guess that does come right out to say that there are those handfuls of people that do not like being in ketosis. They don't like how they feel. They don't process it well. And I never try to push it or shove it down their throat because it, you have to do what works for you. What my homework is for you though, in this case, is just thinking outside the box. I want you to relive a little bit of your childhood if you want to. Trust me, there's parts of my childhood I don't want to relive either, but relive your childhood and think about where you might have been stressing yourself in a good way, what kind of activities, uh, where you were, were you in the heat, like Arizona, were you like, and think about how that applies to how you are today and your response with ketosis. I would really like to see you post down in the comment section below because I'm gonna kind of keep on accruing data. Like I wanna see this. Like tell me your little story down below, like explain, yeah, I grew up here, I did a lot of activity, or I was super sedentary and blah, 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 blah. I just would love to get more data because this epigenetic piece is extremely, extremely fascinating. This might not be for you, and don't worry, I don't need your information. I'm just curious to see it, and I encourage you to think about it. As always, keep it locked in here on my channel. Don't forget to check out Thrive Market in support of this channel as well, and I'll see you tomorrow.